Hi, Marie. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, I um, enjoyed our previous conversations, and when I was thinking about who can I have a conversation with about World Health Day, uh, you were the first person that came to mind, and so I really appreciate you taking some time today. So I'll just uh, introduce you quickly. Um, yeah, Marie uh, Muljani, and she is a registered clinical counselor, uh, and I have the great honor of her living in the riding of West Vancouver Capilano. I'm just wondering, how is mental health playing a role with our children and families right now? Well, thanks, Corinne. It's a pleasure to, to be chatting with you again today. Um, you know, I think that the pandemic has played a huge uh, part on a toll and a, and a challenge for, for children and families. And I think that the experiences are different and they're varied, but everyone has had some experience of difficulty, um, whether that is uh, great or small. And I think that it's important to recognize the uniqueness that everyone feels in this time because it, it is a unique time. Um, more specifically, I think with children, there has been elements of grief and loss, both within their experiences at school, um, with their own experiences of disconnection with their friends. But I think that there is an overlying feeling of trauma that is um, being experienced by everyone and the children feel that um, as well and when I say trauma it usually you know is a, it's a big word it sounds you know you think of you know major things like tornadoes and car crashes but what we're experiencing with COVID is a traumatic experience it's a sustained traumatic experience so what that means for parents is you have a hypervigilance Hypervigilance can be mask wearing, it can be uh, hand sanitizing and washing hands. Um, what I'm seeing in children is a conditioning that's coming out where, you know, I have kids that come in and they need sanitizer because that's just a common thing that they need now. Um, but it's important for children to understand um, that this is not something that is normal and that their experiences are going to be um, felt in different ways. And for parents, there's sort of three questions that I always refer to in any form of trauma. That could be a divorce, a pandemic, a car crash. And children tend to focus on three areas of, um, of questioning and, and they don't have filters. So they're going to give you some fairly direct um, questioning, but really it's like, what has happened? What is going on? And I think that the ever-changing restrictions can be difficult for parents to explain. Um, you know, so parents are in this sort of flux all the time of how to respond. But that clarifying what has happened is a way to also invite the conversation with children. And it's a permission-giving time where they can talk about it. Um, the next question is, how will it affect me? And that's going to be very self-centric to a child. And, you know, it's similar to, well, am I going to go to school? Do I get to see my friends? Why can't I see my friends? While those might, might be tedious questions for parents, that's their way of processing what's going on. And then the final question, which um, can come out in all different ways, is will I be okay? So knowing those three questions, what happened, um, how will it affect me and will I be okay? Always thinking about that when you're working with your children, I think is really important. And in some ways, I also think that it can apply to, to adults. Um, so, you know, I think working with children and knowing that there's this sustained trauma and they don't understand timelines um, is an important piece. So I, I would always stress those three questions in this process. Now, I understand you work at SOLA Counseling um, and the West Coast Family Center Society. These are both on the North Shore. Um, maybe tell me, how does the work that you do there really help you fulfill your mission to your community? Well, I, you know, I, I've always felt there's an importance in, um, you know, having some not-for-profit work as well as private practice. There is different needs for different types of families, and our community is based on a variety of different family units and, and demographics. So in order for a community to thrive, the individuals must all be doing well. So within um, West Coast Family Centers, it's a, it's a organization in, in the Lower Mainland as well. And in that work, I tend to work with families that have been uh, working with the Ministry of Child and Family Development. So 
it, the, they can be fairly severe cases, but um, not always so much. And it's really about uh, family function and co-parenting and those sorts of things. Um, my, by extension of that, moving into my private practice, the work is similar. Um, it's just that it's not through this nonprofit organization. And I feel it's important to give back in different ways. So within my work, um, I do have different scale financial scale rates and things like that to support people. But um, my team um, works from a holistic practice. So we have dietitians and life coaches in different areas so that we can support people in functioning overall. Um, because if your health isn't good, both mentally and physically, it's going to impact one or the other. So, um, you know, my work is really to try and create more of a, a productive community around us. Yeah, I think we've really seen during this pandemic um, issues of, of nutrition. Uh, a lot of seniors in our communities have been isolated in their homes. So there's mm-hmm. mental health issues there. There's physical health issues. And those things are all so closely connected. Um, do you think that because there has been so much more conversation this last year about mental health, that the stigma of actually seeking support for mental health issues or concerns, has it reduced or do you think that stigma is, is still there? I believe it's reduced. I think it's um, mental health is becoming, I don't want to say a trend word, but it's definitely something that is becoming uh, more at the forefront, you know, when we think about the tragedy that happened recently on the North Shore and Lynn Valley, it's immediate that there is an element of mental health that everyone has some some consciousness about in terms of both the people that have uh, been involved, but also the person who caused this. So, you know, I think that there is some awareness about it. Um, the reduction in stigma, I think, is also that there has been an increased accessibility through the internet. There is a lot more private um, online sessions that I do, both with children and adults, uh, in a wide range of ages um, and, and genders. And you know, I think that there can be some relief from that, and then that also will, you know, solidify that maybe this is helpful for me at this time. And, you know, with the pandemic, I think that we are we are built to have a certain level of capacity. And I with all my clients in our initial session, I do something called a capacity chart. And it's really about where your baseline moves on that chart. There's variations of this, but that's what I call it. And, um, you know, I think that the pandemic has moved everyone's baseline up. So, you you know, if you're if you're working with this much space normally and then the pandemic's moved you up, that's where you sit. So your reactivity is going to be different, your ability to cope with things, your isolation, all of that is becoming much more of a problem. And I think that everyone is feeling an element of this because we're all in this pandemic. So I, I really do believe that, you know, the stigmatization is reducing but um, I wouldn't say that it's gone. And I also feel that there are certain things, particularly substance abuse and maybe suicide, that are, that are maybe more difficult to discuss. Right. And those things are escalating in terms of, of, of when they're happening. Absolutely. You had mentioned about um, uh, different access to people now because of the pandemic. Uh, uh, now, I had worked with a counseling group before, and there had been a hesitation previously to actually uh, provide uh, counseling support uh, via Zoom and, and, uh, and, and other ways online. Um, but what I understand now is that there is actually a lot of enthusiasm about this because you're able to access people that you wouldn't normally have been able to access. Um, and it's not ideal to not be uh, physically in the same space as someone, but I also understand men are more likely to, to seek counseling when it's uh, on video and, and there are some benefits. And what, what do you see um, has maybe changed in counseling and mental health support that will stay that way after we go back to what will be our new world after this all is done? Mm. Fingers crossed. Um... I think that there will be some, I mean, if you talk about stigma, (laughs) I think that the stigma really sticking with disconnection physically is now not as much a concern. 
I think because we've had Christmases and various other celebrations and things online, that it started to become, I wouldn't say the norm, but acceptable. And, you know, when I first shifted into this this time last year, I thought, well, how am I going to do this? Um, how am I going to see all of the cues and, and, and connect with people? But the interesting thing is when you look at someone and they're vulnerable and someone is em- empathically there to receive that, that's a connection. And I think when you know you have that service available to you, despite what's going on, it's sort of like the, um, you know, it, it's the the protection from the storm, so to speak. And so I think that there's a lot to be gained. The The other element I, I found very interesting is children are really good at it, really, really good at it. It's the adults that actually have more challenge. But once we get going, um, it's okay. And, um, you know, we've got such great technology now that there's a lot of different things you can do through the internet. We talked a little bit about how there are some things that are escalating because of this pandemic, addictions, overdoses, um, but there's also been um, a heightened concern and incidences of domestic violence and child abuse because uh, we are isolated now at home. Um, Now you're very involved with a program called Stopping the Violence and you do some other work around domestic violence, so can I maybe just ask you what you've seen there and and a little bit about the programs? Sure, sure. So. Um, I also work with an organization called Batter Women Support Services, and um, at the beginning of the lockdown, um, our crisis line had to shift to volunteers to um, actual clinical uh, clinicians um, because the intensity of the calls had shifted from, um, you know, support to essentially a 911 emergency, and um, so it was it required a different maybe set of skills in that moment. And during that time, we, the, the, I think the stat was 327% was the increase on our crisis line calls. And I, I personally have received calls from not only women in those situations, but children. Um, and the challenge is that, again, when I speak about capacity, there are concurrent things that go on with families. It's not un heard of to have a family that might have someone with depression or anxiety or a substance use issue or an anger issue. But when you're under a, a certain level of pressure with this pandemic, along with possibly financial concerns, um, a limit of space and, 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 you know, the isolation from others outside, um, it, it really creates a, a scenario that's quite dangerous in certain cases. And, So yes, there has been a a very high uptick, not only of abuse uh, within families from um, the adults, but also within children. There's also been a high level of neglect because of the increased use of substances that have sort of taken over in families. So children are are sort of in these scenarios where they're sort of stuck. Um, So I think that it's really important to consider the people around you and your neighbors and, and how people are accessing and what sort of, um, how people are accessing the outdoors and their neighbors and their communities. Because while we're all, you know, maybe in these restrictive environments, we have ways to reach out to each other. And it's really important to be able to understand that cycles of abuse have uh, very definitive ways of of sort of having moments of abuse and then to go into sort of what is a honeymoon period. And so to be alert and supportive of neighbors, especially, I think is, is a real key. Um, you know, I think we've talked about providing some numbers and things like that at the end of this to, to provide more support and more tailored support for people. Um, the other element is places for recovery. So transition homes are also in situations where they're restricted. So the inability to get support physically can be a real challenge, which then also contributes to this. So it has been a very difficult um, and in some cases devastating uh, time for people in those sorts of domestic violence scenarios. Right. right. Well, in our community as well, as you know, um, housing is a challenge. 
And mm -hmm. so uh, someone trying to leave a bad situation, especially with the, you know, the transition housing and with the, the COVID um, public health orders, there isn't a lot um, of options in terms of housing for somebody to go to. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's also important for us to understand that these issues are happening in all communities. So this is not mm -hmm. limited to, to certain places. So we have to think about our own neighbors and our own communities and, and get away from that belief that it, it doesn't happen around us and it can't be people that we know. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. do you, it's interesting you said sustained trauma and I hadn't thought about it that way as opposed to an accident that happens at one point and then your recovery kind of starts. Recovery doesn't really start. You're, you're, you're going on with this, but how do you think that this will impact young people in a few years from now, or for the rest of their life, is is this going to be, going to be a point in their life that is going to actually change them a bit? I think that it would be unlikely for it not. Um, I mean, I I couldn't say for sure, and I'm sure we'll see the studies come out fairly, you know, quickly in the, in in the next few years and months. But um, you know, sustained trauma is not something that we're built for. And, you know, you could consider it an element, um, maybe a good comparison might be someone who has been in, uh, grown up in a, a war zone. There are certain behaviors that are going to be a, a adopted um, as, as an adaptation to what they've experienced. So um, there could be a hypervigilance around things. There could be, a, you know, a certain concern about a particular um, behavior or, you know, um, government enforcement or things like that. Um, because it's all about a lack of control in those moments. Our bodies, our nervous systems are built to react in these moments. That's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to fight, flight or freeze. We, we've talked about this, you know, numbers of times. But I think that um, the important thing is to really consider that's a reaction. And then you 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 know the hormones will kick in and and you will recover from it. Right. You'll go through a state of shock and you'll recover and then you'll heal. What happened with this pandemic is last year we went into lockdown and it was to flatten the curve for a couple of weeks if we all recall. Yes, I remember when this all started last year and I think we all thought oh in a few weeks it's going to be over and we'll be back to our our normal lives but that certainly hasn't been the case. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that everyone had that mentality and so it was like okay we'll we'll follow through on what's being requested of us we'll follow these restrictions and then it continued so rather than us training for the marathon we sprinted in the first two weeks so our energy was a bit depleted but this has now gone on over a year and while you know these are necessary restrictions that we ha we need to follow at this point the ability for us to react and recover has never occurred. And the sustained space where our nervous systems are constantly under threat, a, a trauma is really any time that there's a, a, a general threat to your body in, in all forms, emotionally, physically, spiritually, whatever it is. So we have been experiencing that every single day. And uh, the subtle reminders are masks. The big reminders are stay-at-home restrictions and things like that. So we have this sustained level of trauma that we are trying to navigate with very little tools at this point and gas in the tank to continue with it. So what ends up happening is coping mechanisms start to come out. So what we did as an adaptation, we fight, flight, or freeze in those moments. We've been doing that for too long. So the body can't cope with it. So, you, you know, I mean, I'm sure we've all seen the lineups at the liquor store. We, you know, we probably all, you know, what is it, the COVID-19? That's what they're calling it. Like, there's all these different methods that we're using to cope. Um, some may be more acceptable than others, but really it's a way to numb out the stress of this. Um, and what I'm seeing is in my practice that not only is that something that's occurring, but if, say, you had anxiety prior to this or depression, you now have concurrent problem. So it's, it's overwhelming. And that is something that needs support. That's not something to be ashamed of. It's very normal. And, and you know, you can also gain some of those types of mental health issues because of the fatigue. So it can work in both ways. And I think that it's important for people really to realize that 
sometimes there's circumstantial mental health issues that happen. And for you to come in and say, I need some help with this, it's not that there's something wrong with you. It's that there is something going on here that is so much bigger than all of us. And we just need to attend to that problem. This pandemic has has hit us all personally as well. And I mean, I have a young daughter at home um, and we've got multiple things happening. Uh, My daughter is Chinese. We've got issues with Asian discrimination. I've had to have a lot of conversations with her about that. Uh, But I know uh, many other people in this community are suffering and I've run up against people or run into people who are uh, victims of violence in their own homes. And I, I think we don't always think about that in our own community. So have you found that as well? I have. I have received calls um, within this community and I have also, um, you know, seen various different mental health issues um, that extend perhaps from domestic violence, but also in other areas in, in our community. It's mental health does not discriminate. It does not. Um, it, I mean, there's definitely more susceptible populations and we hear about that on the news, but there are a lot of issues that come up in this community specifically. Um, I think that the dissociation or the the, the numbing, we'll call it, um, can really create a pathway to other destructive um, behaviors, whether it is domestic violence or addictions, but it also leads to other feelings of anxiety and depression and disordered eating and all of those sorts of things because really there's no sense of control in this. There's no ability for us to stop this threat. And that can be really, really uh, destabilizing and both for children and adults. So it's really hard to try and stabilize that and then also not have a time frame. We have this unknown time frame, so we can't even set a deadline of let's just get here. So I think that, you know, being considerate of what's going on around us and you know I I mentioned before your neighborhoods and your neighbors are your first points of contact obviously you know we we are connected with friends and family but your neighbors are really key people in this and being aware because sometimes things are going on that you don't know and so checking in with each other is really important not just from a kindness but from a a consideration of, of where people are at um, because yes, it is, uh, you know, my, my practice is busy and, um, you know, the, the calls on the crisis line, as well as the work at West coast and, and other types of organizations like that, we're busy and that's for a reason. So April 7th, uh, is, is world health day. And the theme on world health day this year is, uh, equal access to, to healthcare is that it's, it's come across this last year. We can even see with the vaccine rollout that there's not equity in people being able to access healthcare. And the same is with, is with mental health care as well. Um, have you seen that as being a divide in terms of people who are able to reach out and access and actually have the ability and can find support? A hundred percent. It's one of the reasons that I, I do have some sliding scale options in my practice because I feel ethically that it's something that we have to, we have to do this for our community. And if someone is really suffering, um, they need support. Um, and, and I know organizations like Batter Women and, and West Coast Family Centers, and there's so many other great organizations like that that offer um, not only supports through different organizations such as the Ministry of Child and Family Development, but also have lower rates so that people can try and access this because mental health care is expensive. It is. And that's unfortunate because in a lot of ways, if mental health is not dealt with, it can actually lead to more issues. So it can be a preventative measure. And the challenge I think with mental health is it's not as visible. If if you broke your leg, you would go to a doctor, you would get it set, you would take some time to let it heal, you would, you know, do some physio, those sorts of things, and and people would help you. When you are suffering with deep, agonizing depression, you kind of look grumpy and maybe you're not social and people just think, Oh, that's, that's not a very friendly person, for example, when in actual fact, that's a person that has a debilitating situation. 
that's not who the person is. That's something that they're dealing with. And it needs to be dealt with, much like a broken leg or any other medical ailment. But it's just not visible. So I think, and I hope with this pandemic, what maybe will come of this is a sense of like communal compassion. If we can start being more proactive and kind to people, I think it's going to be a benefit that's come of this experience. You know, when you go for a walk and you see someone walking on their own, smile at them. You may be the only person that they see today and they maybe haven't left their house in three days. You know, the isolation is so debilitating and is so against our human nature. We're, we're born as mammals. We're dependent on each other. The attachment is there. And then we've had this disconnection enforced on us. It's not natural for humans to do this. So I think that it's really important for us to try and, and focus on how mental health could be more accessible to everyone because it will benefit everyone as well. So I'm, I'm really happy to hear that that's the focus. I think it's, it's a paramount issue. Well, thank you very much for talking to me today. I really appreciate it, and I learned a lot as well. Um, we'll have some information at the end of this, uh, any, some supports if people need to contact them. Um, and is there anything, any last thing you want to say about uh, the work you do uh, or the community that you live in? Um, well, thank you for this. It, it's always a privilege to chat with you, and I, I, I'm very passionate about this topic. It's... Um, when I think when you become a, a clinical counselor, it's it's really a lifestyle that you you take on. And I think our community has so many great things and so many great people and so many great programs. And for us to try and really foster more of a sense of care and compassion is really, I think, the focus. Because the reactivity and the anger, I think, that we're seeing in different scenarios is also maybe part of the trauma and the sustained trauma that I talked about. So when we separate ourselves from what's in front of us and actually think what's going on for that person behind it, it creates a sense of empathy. And I think if we can work with people that way in all scenarios, it will really build a much better city and, and a happier place. So that's really my hope. Great. Well, thank you very much. It was really nice having a chance to speak with you, and I'll look forward to, to seeing you again at, at some point soon, hopefully in person.